Wednesday, she told me the story of how as a pilot of a heck in the first week of November, this was January, the first week in November. Mr. President, it was over 10 years ago there was a State of the Union address about to take place. And as members of the Senate were given a ticket for a guest to attend. And my staff came to me and said, who would you like to invite? And I said, why don't we call out to Walter Reed Hospital and see if there's an Illinois soldier there that's up to, physically up to coming up to Capitol Hill for the occasion. They said, we'll check it out. They came back to me an hour or two later and said, we found a veteran. She's a member of the Illinois National Guard. She's recuperating at Walter Reed and she can attend. And I said, fine, I look forward to meeting her. The night of the State of the Union address, they told me that the officer from the Guard was in my office and wheeled open the doors and in came Tammy Duckworth. Tammy was in a wheelchair in full dress uniform, being pushed by her husband, Brian, also a member of the Illinois National Guard. This was in the month of January, toward the end of the month. And with a big smile on her face, she told me the story of how as a pilot of a helicopter with the Illinois Guard, she was shot down over Iraq in the first week of November. This was January, the first week of November. And she'd gone through a series of surgeries. The result of that was she had lost both of her legs. At the time, her arm was, right arm was still in a sling, and there was a question about whether or not she would lose that as well. So she was in serious medical condition, but you would never know it. She was just beaming with pride and happiness, and I thought, what a remarkable human being. So she became not only an acquaintance, but started to become a friend, and has become a very dear friend to me today. I'm so honored that uh, we have as good a relationship as we do. It's perfect. I'm for Tammy. Whatever she's for, I'm for Tammy. And I've found that that's a good standard to live by in Illinois and American politics. So I worked with her through several political campaigns. Her first race for the House of Representatives ended up in defeat, big disappointment, but she never gave up. She never does. Ran again, elected to the U.S. House, and eventually filled the vacancy of Barack Obama when he moved to the presidency. She became the, my colleague and senator from the state of Illinois. We have a great political friendship, a great governmental friendship, but a very great personal friendship. Mr. President, I remember the day I was driving from Springfield in central Illinois to Bloomington, Illinois for a meeting. The phone rang and it was Tammy Duckworth calling. I said, what's up, Tammy? She said, well, I have some news that I'm sharing with very few people I wanted to share with you. I said, what's that? She said, I'm about to become a mother. I couldn't believe it. I literally couldn't believe it. After what she and that valiant body of hers had been through in big combat for the United States. I couldn't believe that she had that opportunity to start a family, and she did. The reason, of course, was in vitro fertilization. She had been working on it for a long time with Bryant to have their first child. They had all but given up when a mutual friend of ours, Judy Gold, in the city of Chicago said, there's one more expert you've got to see. He never fails to create a family. She went to this man and thank goodness it worked. She became a mother and it was a remarkable achievement after all she had been through and all her body had been through that she could reach that point. I can't tell you the pride that was beaming in her face when I first saw her with the baby. She really believed that she'd achieved something that many people didn't think was possible. Fast forward, if you will, to several years later, and she said to me on the floor of the Senate, I need to talk to you about something personal. And we went up to my office and closed the door, and she said, I'm going to have another baby. I said, I can't believe it. She said, uh, the IVF worked the second time. So she now has two daughters, beautiful family. She loves them dearly. 
I think about that when I think about the debate that's going on now, the national debate that was manifest in the decision of the Alabama Supreme Court last week. When they decided, that court decided, consistent with the Dobbs decision, that IVF would no longer be legal in the state of Alabama. As a result of that decision, IVF clinics were threatened and some even closed in the area for fear of criminal prosecution for bringing to this earth children for loving families, just like Tammy's. Well, Tammy Duckworth has spoken out even this morning on the issue and what it means to her personally and what it means to all of us who value those individuals who fight so hard to create a family, which is what she did and so successfully. Mr. President, it was nearly two years ago the Supreme Court's right-wing majority made the disastrous decision to overrule Roe Ro Ro versus Wade, striking down the con constitutional protections that afforded women the right to decide when, how, and whether to have children. That is at the heart of this whole debate. It is at the heart of the IVF issue. Now we live in a world of Dobbs, where Republicans have seized the opportunity to restrict the repro reproductive rights, health, and freedom of families across America. Since the Dobbs ruling, Republican-led states have imposed abortion bans that threaten women's lives, and Republicans in Congress are attempting to pass a national abortion ban. Now it has gone one step forward, as we knew it would. Last week, the Alabama Supreme Court, which is made up entirely of Republican appointees, ruled that frozen embryo embryos are legally children and that their destruction can be treated like the wrongful death of a child. That decision cited Dobbs multiple times. And I might add, if you read excerpts of the decision, they not only relied on a warped view of the Constitution and other statutes. At one point, the Chief Justice said that what was at issue was the wrath of God. The wrath of God. Think of that for a moment. In a civil court in America, in the state of Alabama, that was his basis for part of his ruling. This unprecedented decision had already had serious consequences for reproductive rights in the state of Alabama, as major health care providers have halted in vitro fertilization out of fear of prosecution. For those who desperately want a baby but struggle with infertility, for cancer patients who must safeguard future reproductive options as they undergo treatment, for same-sex couples who use IVF to expand their families, this ruling is devastating. How can congressional Republicans call themselves pro-life, the pro-family party, when they are actively preventing women from using modern science to start a family? How can they be for life when they are supporting laws that endanger women's lives? Predictably, Republicans are scrambling away from their earlier thinking, fearing that this extreme, unpopular measure will hurt their election chances in November. Republicans are simultaneously claiming they support IVF while continuing to support the bills that would codify that life begins at conception. Look at the record. In December 2022, when Senator Duckworth asked for unanimous consent to pass a bill that would have established federal protection for access to IVF and other family treatments, the junior senator, Republican senator from Mississippi, blocked it on behalf of the Republican caucus. That was just two years ago. Because of these extreme Republicans, we now live in a country where women are forced to carry pregnancies, including victims of rape and incest, women carrying non-viable pregnancies and women whose pregnancies put their own lives at risk. And because of the same ex extreme Republicans, we live in a country where women who desperately want to become mothers but who need the help of IVF may now be denied that opportunity. It is unconscionable that Republicans would go this far, but not surprising. Remember that quote from Maya Angelou. When someone shows you who they really are, believe them the first time. Republicans have told us that they will continue to attack women's rights. Sadly, I believe them. 
we'd be foolish not to take them at their word. Remember when Donald Trump promised to appoint Supreme Court justices who would overrule Roe versus Wade? He did, and they did. I am committed to working with my Democratic colleagues to safeguard women's reproductive rights. And I do this in memory of my great colleague and friend, Tammy Duckworth. She is standing up for women all across America who want the chance to fight for the opportunity to create their own families. I hope that this country comes to its senses. We're going to have a hearing on this issue on March 13th in the Senate Judiciary Committee. It is important enough, it is timely enough that we do it and do it effectively. Mr. President, <coughs> I want to raise another topic in the jurisdiction of the committee. In December 2021, Bobby Everson was killed while he was in the care and custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, allegedly by his cellmate. At the time of his death, he was housed at the federal prison in Thompson, Illinois, in the Special Management Unit, a unit notorious for poor management, harsh conditions, even before the Bureau of Prisons moved into Thompson from U.S. Prison Lewisburg in 2018. After an investigation by the Marshall Project and NPR, found that Thompson had become one of the nation's deadliest prisons, I asked the Inspector General, Michael Horowitz, to examine Thompson as part of an investigation into the hundreds of deaths at Bureau of Prison facilities. One year ago, the Special Management Unit at Thompson was finally closed for good, and now we have the findings of the Inspector General's investigation. The Inspector General found things that are truly disturbing about our American prison system. He reports that operational and managerial deficiencies within the prison system have created unsafe conditions and presented critical threats to incarcerated individuals. Significant recurring issues like the failure to comply with policy, understaffing, insufficient mental health and substance abuse treatment have increased the risk and contributed to more and more deaths that are preventable. A present sentence should not be a death sentence in America. The Inspector General's report also highlights that over half of the deaths in the scope of, were super, in, in that scope were suicides, and almost half the suicides occurred in restricted housing, otherwise known as solitary confinement. Earlier this month, the GAO released a compelling report on BOP's use of solitary confinement. Their findings were extremely troubling. As of October 2023, the Bureau of Prisons housed more almost 8% of its prison population in solitary. Almost 8%. In many cases, people were confined in their cells for 23 hours a day. We know that the overuse of solitary confinement causes lasting, irreparable mental harm to incarcerated people. That is why I will soon reintroduce the Solitary Confinement Reform Act, legislation that would greatly limit the use of solitary confinement in our nation's prison system. <laughs> Depriving incarcerated adults of basic human rights and endangering their lives is no way to achieve justice. The Bureau of Prisons must do more to create safer and more humane conditions. As Chairman of Senate Judiciary, I will establish the practice of holding annual oversight hearings for the Bureau of Prisons. Tomorrow we'll hear from the Bureau of Prisons Director Colette Peters and the IG Michael Horowitz to discuss this I report and examine what led to these deadly failures. The goal of our criminal system must be to rehabilitate offenders and prepare them to successfully re-enter society. Solitary confinement is not the avenue to pursue for assimilating these people back into America. It is long past time for the BOP to achieve this goal, and it will only do so through transparency, accountability, and reform. Mr. President, it's been years now since I read an article in Atlantic Magazine by Atul Gawande, a physician in the Boston area who is now working in the Biden administration for USAID. I think he's an extraordinary observer of the, of the human scene. And he wrote an entire article about the impact on the human mind of isolation and confinement. He started talking about prisoners of war, like John McCain, a national hero and the impact five years plus of incarceration had on him and his attitude toward life. And he went on to say that incarceration in our penal facilities is really not the right preparation for individuals who 
most will ultimately be released into society. I held two public hearings on solitary confinement and brought in one man who had been on death row in Texas for 10 years. He was an emotional basket case. He will never have a normal life as long as he lives. Another man who'd been in a similar circumstance in another state seemed to have assimilated well. He was now an over-the-road truck driver uh, in uh, the Midwest. They each told about what it meant each day to have 23 hours of isolation and then one hour where they knew there was another human being on Earth. That sort of treatment is inhumane at its heart. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary to maintain order in the situation. I understand that, but it should never be encouraged. Unfortunately, I'm sad to say that despite my interest in this issue, I have not made an appreciable difference in the number of people who are in solitary confinement in our prisons. We can do better. We must do better. The hearing which we will be hearing from the Inspector General gives us the guidelines to follow to improve this situation. I yield the floor. They said, well, check it out. They came back to me in our helicopter with the only guard. She was shot down over Iraq. The union address about to take place. And as members of the Senate, why don't we call out to Walter Reed Hospital and see if there's an Illinois soldier there. And my staff came to me and said, who would you like to invite? And I said, the officer from the guard was in my office and wheeled open the doors and then were given a ticket for a guest to attend. That's up to, physically up to coming up the Capitol Hill for the occasion. And Brian, also a member of the Illinois National Guard. This was in the month of in a wheelchair in full dress uniform being pushed by her husband, the Illinois National Guard. She's recuperating at Walter Reed and she can attend. Mr. President, it was over 10 years ago. There was a state leader and said, we found a veteran. She's a member of the member. And she'd gone through a series of surgeries. Came Tammy Duckworth. Tammy was, she told me the story of how as a pilot of a